I want to share a moment with you. It's elegant, breathtaking, sweet, full of love and devotion, <coughs> everything good. And it comes right after a time of sin and hatred, just before another verse of sin. In between these two dark verses, these two <coughs> malicious, horrible events, in that darkness shines this little candle. That darkness is gone, but the candle stays. Christ stays. That which he says and does is perfect. <coughs> this event is one of the rare events that's found in all four Gospels. The only miracle that Jesus did in all four Gospels is the feeding of the 5,000. But this event is recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I'll be referring to all of them today. There are four reporters, each includes some details that the other doesn't include. So to get the whole picture, I'll be going, sharing some things from, from Matthew. I'll be starting out of Mark, because he gives the most detail to it. Mark is the shortest of the Gospels in only 16 chapters. It's the power gospel. He talks more about what Jesus did than what he said. He tells of fewer miracles, and he gives more details in the miracles. And that's the case here, this, this moment in Jesus' life. Uh, Mark gives more details about it than Matthew or Luke or John does. Now, Mark is, uh, like I said, it's only 628 verses, but chapter 14 is 72 verses. It's the longest chapter in the book of Mark. And it has this, this incident, this moment in the life of Christ. Now, theologically, biblically, this moment is referred to as the anointing in heaven. <laughs> so now some of you know where we're going with this. I'm going to read the account of Mark. I'm going to read it through. These nine verses, and then I'm going to come back and just expound this to you. God on this. The Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 14, verses 1 through 9. After two days was the feast of the Passover, and of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, not on this feast day, this to be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and then given to the poor. And they murmured against her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For you have the poor with you always, and whensoever you will, you will, you may do them good, but me you have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body to the burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of her for a memorial. That verse is fulfilled in Charleston, Maine, today, right here, right now. Because I'm telling you again, this he said, wherever this is preached, she will be remembered what she did. Now let's begin to unlock this verse and look at some of the words in the other verses and, and put the whole picture together. And I hope by the time we're coming to the end of this message, you'll see the beauty of this moment, why it was so beautiful for him. Now, about five or six days after this anointing, he was dead. This happened just before he died. And Many times he tried to tell his disciples, in fact, there's five or six times, he told the same thing in the four Gospels. I must go to Jerusalem, I must be crucified, and I'll rise again the third day. They never got it. But somewhere Mary heard this, this woman, John tells us her name was Mary, we know who she was. And she thought to herself, this isn't a parable. He's not kidding. My Lord is going to die. And she moved like nobody else did while he was still alive. She got it. It's usually the women that do, by the way. <laughs> in John 19, 25, they stood by the cross, five people, four of them were women. They seem to have more sensitivity on some of these things than some of us guys. I know I'm slow growing up. In fact, I'm still growing up. So let's go back and look at this. After two days was the feast of the Passover. Passover was the most important Jewish holiday. It was established in Exodus in the 12th chapter. We get our communion service from it. It was a one-day event, followed by a seven-day feast of unleavened bread for a total of eight days. That this went together. The Passover, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And, in the, and the chief priests and scribes 
<laughs> saw how they might take him by craft and put him to death. To, to, to death. Now the uh, the word craft there, the Greek word means deceit, and it comes from uh, another Greek word uh, that means entrapment. So it's not craft as isn't a really good. It's deceit. It's a bad thing. We have in today. Today the world is full of crafty politicians. You know the spirit is still with us. The puppets change, but the hand inside the puppet is the same hand. It's the same. It's the same hand. It's the devil's hand. But they operate the same way. These people are murmuring against him. You know nothing is surprises God. There was a, a line in a song that said, "Did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God?" He already knows. The wicked in his pride, this is from Psalm 10, written 700 years before Jesus was crucified. The wicked in his pride that persecute. The wicked boast of his heart's desires. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in his thoughts. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. He sitteth in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret place doth he murder the innocent. That's the spirit that was in the scribes and Pharisees. If you want to read how Jesus fell about them, read the 23rd chapter of Matthew. And you'll hear the most pungent, very powerfully strong language that Jesus ever used. It's condemnatory, like you wouldn't believe. You nest of vipers, you shall all perish in hell. I mean, he, he really condemns hypocrites and Pharisees. They're still with us today, that's why. Churches are full of them. The, the, the spirit of the Pharisees is still alive, that's why it's so much press and he was given to it. So they're plotting to kill him, so that's the one darkness. While he's here, they're after him now. If he doesn't resist, he knows his hour has come. Remember at John, the second chapter of the wedding of Cana, when Jesus turned the water into wine, he said to his, his mother, woman, what have I to do? My hour has not yet come. Now his hour has come. And he submits to the things that are going on. He knows he's about to go to the cross. That's what he came for. It wasn't something that happened to him. And being in Bethany, Bethany is a little town, about two miles southeast of Jerusalem, he was in the house of Simon the leper. Simon was probably a commentator to believe a leper that Jesus healed. And um, also, um, John 12, 3 tells us that um, Lazarus was there. And they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them who sat at the table with him. And um, remember those chief priests? I told you how full of malice they were. Look at John 12, oh, you don't have to look at John 12, 10. But the chief priest consulted that they might put Lazarus to death also. They weren't happy just putting Jesus to death, but he raised this man from the dead, we've got to put him to death too. You see the malice, the anger, the satanic impulses in these Pharisees. It's okay. God prayed for their forgiveness. Christ, the first word that out of his mouth on the cross was, Father, forgive them. That includes the whole bunch of them. It includes the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, it includes Judas. It includes everybody, includes you and me. We pray down the center for all of the sins we commit. He sat at me, there came a woman, again in John 12, 3, identifies her as Mary. <coughs> Remember Mary and Martha? Remember Luke 10, 38 to 42? Jesus was at their house. Martha was busy serving the supper, but Mary sat at his feet. Remember that. She sat at his feet, listening to his word. You may remember I talked to that word, listening to the Greek verb, a koan means a continuous action. She was always, it was a habit with her to listen to God. She revered him. She loved him. She sat at his feet and learned from him. He didn't save us to make us worker bees. He saved us to make us his children. Yes, he wants us to serve him. He wants us to work for him, absolutely. But he wants us to sit at his feet. He wants to spend time with us. He wants to love us as the father loves his children. So she came having an alabaster box. Alabaster means it's from Alabastron. It's a city in Egypt. Well, actually, this is the anointing vial that we use here. This is alabaster. This is from alabaster. It's a white, beautiful marble, and it holds the fragrance. Now, this ointment is spikenard. It tells you that. Spikenard comes from a plant in India, from the root of the plant. And it, it's the most pungent, melodious, voluferous fragrance that there is. It fills the whole room. And it, this little spike art contains it, alabaster contains it. And by the way, the color, I just found this out yesterday morning. I was digging into spike art. <laughs> Hard thing to dig into. But I found out the color of it is rose red. See the picture? Isn't that interesting? She anoints him with perfume that's blood colored. I 
still haven't figured all that out, but it speaks to my heart. An alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she break the box and poured it on his head. But the box really means the, the container, the, the neck of the container. It probably had a, a longer neck. And rather than just remove the seal that was usually on these flasks, she just broke it. As if to say, this is not going to be used for anything else except honoring God, except honoring Christ. That's what this is for. And it's, it's as expensive as it is and as beautiful as it is, it will never be used for anything else. Then that honor me, I will honor indeed, as he did. She poured it on his head. Now in John 12, 3, it says they poured it on his head and his feet, and the fragrance filled the house. It says that in Solomon, Solomon, Solomon 1, 12. On his feet. Remember, she sat on his feet. And this, now she's pouring this fragrance, blood red, wonderful smelling ring, on his feet. You know, the world makes a mockery of the things of God. It loves to sink its teeth into that which is holy, that which is pure. But God says, be ye therefore holy as I am holy. He wants us to be a holy people. There's no expiration date on that. And what she did, the word holy, hagiazo, means separate, different than everybody else. You know, and, and what she did was just so beautiful. But then, of course, <clears throat> verse 4, there were some that had indignation. Now, the son there, John, tells us that the son, guess who spoke up here? Then one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, said, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? 300 pence is a year's wages. So it was expensive. And she didn't care. She gave it all to him. She poured it all on him, and she saw that the, the, the flask would never be used again. This he said not because he cared for the poor, but because it was a thief. And he had the bag and he bare what was put there when he was stealing them. So guess who's complaining? It's Judas. It might have been sold for more than 300 pence and given to the point, and they murmured against him. And bro, omahi is the word murmur, and it means to snort with anger and indignation, to growl. Sometimes it's translated growl. What did she do that for? If you're going to do something holy for God, it's good for God. Expect to have somebody growl at you. The higher you go with the Lord, the higher you go with the Lord, the more people are not going to understand you. Prepare to be misunderstood. Prepare to be alone. And not have anybody agree with you. Nobody agreed with her. But there's nothing can change that light of love. She loved him. And she was going to sanctify him and honor him. She didn't care who said what. And sometimes when you're walking with God, you just got to put one foot in front of the other and go forward. And like Billy Graham used to say a lot, as for me, I'm moving on. I'm going forward with what God called me to do. And that's what she did here. She heard a murmuring. She knew she was the object of indignation and criticism. Oh my goodness, any fool could criticize. <laughs> my grandfather used to say that it takes a good carpenter to build a barn, but any jackass can kick it down. <laughs> you know, that kind of, that kind of you know, it, takes, <laughs> it doesn't take any any talent to, to criticize, you know. And I've known a few people like to think they have a special gift. There was a story of a woman who felt she had the talent for criticism. She talked to her pastor about it. So I think that God's really given me a, a talent to criticize. And he said to her, he said, well, ma'am, I, I think that God wouldn't mind if you buried that talent. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> peril of burying the talent. Anyway, and Jesus said to her, leave her alone. I like that. He just stepped up and defended her. He was always a defender of womanhood. He was always a defender of the weak. People who were covered with leprosy, whose blistering lips drank from the crystal water of life that he offered to them. He was always there for those who were low. He loved them. He expects us to love them that way, too. You know, leave her alone. I, I love him. He was a man's man. He always, he always protected, blessed children. No man ever stoops so tall as when he kneels to bless a child. And the mark of, of a great man, the mark of a strong man, is how he treats the weak person, how he treats the poor and the helpless, how he treats people who can't do a thing for him. He can receive nothing from them. That's the mark of a man, is how he treats those people. And that Jesus was always showing kindness and love and gentleness to those who could do nothing for him. And many times they turned their back on them. Many times they weren't there. 
Again, when he hung on that cross, where were they? And at that moment, the moment of his greatest need, his disciples were hiding from him. All the people he had blessed didn't say any of them were there except for John, Mary Magdalene, Mary the wife of Cleophas, Mary his mother, and one un unnamed aunt. And that was it, five people. But he did it anyway. And leave her alone. I like that. You know, he hears this murmuring, and it's almost like he's hearing them murmuring. And he turns and says, Shut up! Put a muzzle on it. <laughs> Leave her alone. <laughs> I know that's a little a little virulent, but there's that spirit in this. Leave her alone. I think there's a little indignation in that. And, and, and I, I try to look at the, the structure of the language here, going from, from Greek to, to English, and there is that feeling of, of indignation. No, he never had that for himself. You know, I mean, in a little while he would be spit upon. He never said anything. He would be smoked. His face would be disfigured to be so beaten. Stripes on his back. You know, he'd be lied about, cheated about, mocked when he was on the cross. He never had any indignation. He stood there before Pilate, totally in silence. Pilate had never seen that before. He used to see people <coughs> saying, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, <laughs> grumbling for their lives. Jesus just stood there. All those insults, he never said a word. But here, somebody is insulting this, this person, and he steps in for them. With a, just a tinge of righteous indignation. The same way he overturned the money tables. He did that twice in his ministry. Once in John, at the beginning, and once at the end of his ministry. He said, he quoted Isaiah, my father's house shall be a house of prayer, and you've made it a house of merchandise. You know, you're not reverencing the things of God by, by this money thing they were doing there. What they're doing, you have to pay temple taxes, and you could get you could get a dollar of the temple tax money if you paid them ten dollars. You know, they were making money off of God. And they were corrupting his house, and Jesus saw it. And he came in, and he overturned the money table. I did that in class one time last year at Hyde to, to illustrate that. I grabbed the table, and I just flipped it over. And everything went up, pencils, books, chairs, a big knot. And I said, well, that's what it looked like. Kids were talking about that in class. You know, I remember, Pastor McClendon, when you did that. Yeah, it's not the kind of thing you forget. That's why I did it. It's an object lesson. He overturned the table. He made a cord, and he drove them out. He was angry at them because they were hurting his father, not him. And he, that same spirit is here. Leave her alone. Why trouble you her? She hath fought a good work on me. It says good work. I wished, I love the King James Bible. I love the poetry of it, the rhythm of it. I love the V's and the vowels. I love that reading it, it doesn't sign the front page of the New York Times. It sounds different. And it's a good translation. But no translation is perfect. In this word good, it's a, it's a good word. <laughs> no pun intended. But the, the Greek word is kalos. Kalos means beautiful. Remember I told you I was going to talk about a beautiful work. Well, this is where it is. He said that what she did was beautiful. It was beauty in that. You know, there's another concept that the world... Uh, goes after beauty. Everybody wants to be beautiful. And, you know, beauty is only skin deep, but ugly goes right to the bone. You ever heard that before? <laughs> you know, it's, it's a simple thing. And we go, all these efforts we go to, to look beautiful. You know, the, <laughs> I heard somebody say the other day that cosmetics <coughs> is a, a billion dollar a year in <coughs> And that's just for the men. <laughs> Well, we spend on hair care and lip gloss and, and things, you know, and clothing to look beautiful. But beauty is in this moment. The soul of this woman was beautiful. Nothing can touch that. And the good news is that every man and every woman in this church today, on this planet, can be the recipients of that scripture that says, may the beauty of the Lord be upon us. All of you here can have the beauty of Christ on you. It makes no difference who you are, what your past is, what your present is. You can begin to have that beauty of soul. Even Christ says, she's done a beautiful work. And he needed that. And he says, for the poor you have with you always, and you can do the good whatever you want, but she has done what she could. God doesn't ask you to do what you can. He asks you to do what you can. And, and it's... it's a, it just popped in my mind a missionary, who a medical missionary in Africa, been there for about 30 years, and he had to go home for training and to get some supplies he couldn't get. And he hated to leave his little mission station in this village. 
And he was only going to be gone three months, but he hated to leave because he loved these people. And he, the morning he was to leave, he got up, and there was a little boy sitting outside of his hut with this beautiful conch seashell. And he gave it to the missionary as a gift. And the missionary said, well, that's beautiful. But <clears throat> those conches come from the shore, which is 50 miles from here. It's a 100-mile round-trip walk. And the little boy smiled at him and said, long walk, part of gift. Isn't that sweet? That's the heart. There's the beauty in it. You know, she, she has done what she could. And he says, he, she has come beforehand to anoint my body for the rain. You ever notice if somebody dies at a funeral parlor, they'll get 400 things of flowers, flowers all over the place. Why don't you send them to those people when they're alive? You know, when they can do some good. They're dead. They're not gonna, they're gonna care when you get flowers in them. Yeah, it can be a comfort to people, but I, I've, I've had a lot of funerals. I've had over 100 funerals in my ministry, and a lot of times I know the backgrounds of the family. And I thought if this poor woman had only got this many flowers when she was alive, if somebody might let, him, let her know that she was loved and cared for, it would have done so much more good. She did what she could before the burial. And then this final thing, verily I say unto you, wherever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial for her. 1 Samuel 2.30 says, God says, then then honor me, I will honor. She honored God, and God honored her by putting her. We're talking about her here today. As I said at the beginning of this, thus is this fulfilled. Wherever this gospel I just preached it to you, it will be done as a memorial for her. It was, it is, it has been, and it will be. And every time a preacher anywhere, a teacher, shares this verse, this prophecy that Jesus said is fulfilled. That's verse 9. The next verse, verse 10, you know. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priest to betray him unto them. This thing ends with a bunch of people trying to put him to death. And, and then the, other, the verse on the other side is Judas betraying him. But in the middle is this bright light. is this beautiful moment in the life of Christ. You can be givers of those beautiful moments. <coughs> all of you here. What, what does it feel like to, to bless the Lord that way? Maybe I should talk about that on Wednesday nights for a while. How can you be a Mary? How can you do something for him? And many of you do already. Many of you do already. Some of you, I don't know what you do. You know, all of us can, can, can love him that way and worship him that way. Those, those special, precious moments that he remembers. You know, and I wonder about Mary when the, after the cross, his life went on for her into the day. Her dark hair turned white and she grew of age and eventually she went home to be with him. But I wonder how the rest of her life was. I wonder what her memory was for this moment when, when she, she showed this love and honor to Christ. I don't know. We're going to uh, pray that God will do that for us. Father, thank you for the example that Mary of Bethany set for everybody here. For me, for all of my brothers and sisters in this room, thank you. She did what she could. She held nothing back. She sanctified that ointment, that fragrance, and the flask itself, everything she gave to him. She gave her all to him out of love, out of an understanding of who he was and what was coming. It was an act of worship, Lord, in spirit and in truth. May that spirit infect every one of us here. Some people talk about catching a flu or a COVID. May we catch this, Lord. <laughs> May this be something that comes into our soul and enables us to love you that way. Help us, Lord, to learn from dear little Mary of Bethany and have those moments which we honor him who died for us. What could he ask for us that we should not give him? He died for us. He suffered for us more than any man has ever suffered. And he did it willingly and joyfully because he loves us. How can we hold anything back from him? He deserves the very best we have to give. May that be so in this church, Lord, for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen.